Hello, I'm Ruth Werner, and this is my audiovisual sidebar to my feature article, COVID-19 Complications, which appears in the September-October issue of Massage and Bodywork magazine. In the article, I run through some of the complications of infection with SARS-CoV-2 that are most likely to impact decisions about massage therapy, at least as we understand in early summer 2020. With each section, I have included a few ideas about how this situation, liver damage or heart damage or sensory problems, for instance, might impact our hands-on work. Writing guidance for hands-on work is actually pretty hard to do because I have no idea what your practice looks like and what your skill sets are and what you envision when I say things like work conservatively or aim for incremental changes. Furthermore, while I know a lot about massage in general, I am by no means an expert in many specific techniques, and I can't speak with authority on how you should make appropriate adjustments. That's your job. What I can do is provide some of the information that may influence your clinical decisions. At some point, I expect to write something for massage and body work on critical thinking and clinical decision making in the context of pathologies. It's a process we often take for granted, and it deserves some thorough analysis. But in the short run, I would like to offer eight key questions that are appropriate for clients who have been through a COVID-19 infection so that we have the information we need to make appropriate adjustments, especially for those people whose recovery process has been complex. As I say in the column over and over and over again, the most important piece of information we need is a really thorough idea of our client's allostatic capacity. That is, how easily can they adapt to changes in their environment to maintain homeostasis? If it feels painful or scary for them to exercise, that's an important piece of information. Their allostatic capacity may be limited. If they're back to pre-infection levels of physical activity with no repercussions, that's useful to know too. All of this gives us some sense of where to start as they begin to incorporate massage therapy back into their lives. Another repeating theme from the article is an emphasis on gentle work that slowly progresses toward pre-infection levels of intensity. And this work must always be done within the physical demands of our clients' activities of daily living. What does gentle work mean? Well, to me, it means the most difficult kind of massage there is to give. Light pressure with total presence. Think Walton scale one to two, if that's familiar to not, or if that's familiar to you. And if not, think about gentle holding and the pressure of applying lotion. It's not time to use our elbows. It is not even time to use pointy thumbs. Because COVID-19 can lead to superficial and deep blood vessel damage, it is vital that we not risk disrupting or overwhelming a system that is already challenged. We really want to be focusing on soothing a jangled nervous system, not on forcing a lot of fluid flow. This is also why I strongly recommend that massage therapists contact their clients the following day to see how they are and if they had any unexpected responses or reactions to their massage. These reactions could be really positive, like they slept great or they woke up without back pain for the first time since March. But if they're more iffy, like if they had a sense of chest pressure or new bruises came up later or they went home with a headache, that is really important information too, and you might miss it if you don't specifically ask. So what kinds of questions do we need to ask our clients who have been through a bout with COVID-19? Here is my short list for your consideration. These would be in addition to our regular intake questions, of course. Number one, what does your doctor say about your risk of communicability? We know that a lot of people may have had COVID-19 and never gotten an official diagnosis. If your client has been cleared to come out of isolation and return to work or school, then theoretically at least, they should not be capable of spreading the infection. But if they haven't been cleared, then for your sake and theirs, 
you need to delay your session. Number two, what does your do medical doctor say about getting physical activity? If a patient is advised to return to normal activity levels as soon as possible, a massage is more likely to be safe. But if a person has had significant lung or cardiovascular or kidney damage, they may be on a rehabilitation program that limits their physical activity. If this is the case, the intensity of massage therapy must also be scaled back. Question three, what do you do in terms of physical activity? We need a clear sense of what kinds of physical challenges people put their bodies through on a daily basis. One person might be mainly sedentary, but they can take a hot shower each morning. Someone else might walk a few times a week, and another client might be training for an event, even after a severe infection. Within these questions, we must dig out the most specific information we can find. Walking a mile might mean a leisurely stroll on a smooth sidewalk, or it might mean a quick jaunt up a hill that raises the heart rate. And that makes a difference in our client's ability to adapt to environmental challenges. Further, many COVID-19 survivors have widely varying and unpredictable levels of fatigue and loss of energy, and we must not risk overwhelming someone's physical capacity with overenthusiastic massage. Question four, do you have any new, that is, since your infection, skin marks, lesions, or rashes, especially on the toes, but really anywhere on the body? If the answer is yes, delay the session until these have cleared or use very light work everywhere and especially in the area of discoloration. This may be a sign of microvascular clotting or bleeding, especially if the lesions don't blanch with finger pressure. Any rash that is itchy, swollen, or involves compromised skin, of course, contraindicates massage, at least in that area. Question five, do you have any new, that is since your infection, experience of severe deep muscle or joint pain that is unrelated to recent physical activity? I wanna emphasize this means very severe pain that is unlike things that they had before their infection. If the answer is yes, then refer them to their primary care provider who really should know about this. This symptom might prompt people to seek massage but it can be an indicator of acute inflammation, muscle damage, or poor tissue perfusion. And as we said in the article, if we can rule out rhabdomyolysis, then we can probably offer gentle soothing work safely in the meantime. Question six, do you have any new, that is since your infection, discomfort with exertion? Watch out especially for reports of chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, headache, cramping in a new pattern, or new pain in the legs. If the answer to this is yes, refer them to their primary care provider because it may be a sign of cardiovascular or respiratory distress. Question number seven, are you taking any drugs to manage blood clotting? If the answer is yes, Delay massage until this is finished or use our super light work because of the risk of blood clotting and bruising. And question number eight, what other long-term consequences of your infection now affect your life? This could include all kinds of things that might impact choices about massage. Relapsing symptoms might happen or kidney dysfunction, gut pain, headaches, heart problems, debilitating fatigue, seizures, PTSD or delirium related to the trauma of surviving a life-threatening infection, or things we haven't even thought of yet. Decisions about body work must be made with these complications in mind, so you might want to have a decent pathology reference at hand. All of these questions and the decision points and rationales are available for anyone at my blog post here at abmp.com. This list of questions must continue to evolve as we learn more about short-term and long-term challenges that people who have lived through COVID-19 may face. This is just a starting place, and I hope it is helpful. Thank you.